thank you all for coming. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, so like I previewed kind of in the sign up for this webinar, there are going to be a few Mercy Ships trivia questions. So if you have um, kind of been um, on my mailing list for a while, maybe if you've been following Mercy Ships news, you'll know um, maybe some of the answers to them, but I thought it'd be kind of a fun way to break up the presentation. And just to start out with a little bit of Mercy Ships history, um, Mercy Ships was founded in 1978, so they turned 42 this year. And originally they were part of another Christian organization. And I'm just curious if anyone happens to know what organization that was. Was it YWAM? It was, yes. I had multiple choice just in oh, case like, oh, nobody got I it. Sorry, it, I just it was totally on. YWAM, yes. Um, so Mercy Ships first started as a part of YWAM. So lots of people that have been around for a really long time will talk about um, starting Mercy Ships as part of a DTS. They were doing a discipleship training school with YWAM, which had them go and work on a ship. Um, and do you give medical care? And so the, it used to be um, just totally integrated with YWAM. And then eventually, I couldn't tell you what year, but they did um, split off just for, you know, liability reasons. Surgery is a rather high liability activity. Um, and so they um, became two completely separate organizations, but still have a good relationship with each other. Um, and that brings me to our mission statement, which is that um, or not our mission statement, but kind of the reason that Mercy Ships was founded was that 5 billion people lack access to safe, affordable, and timely surgery. So that's 5 billion people out of the 7.8-ish billion people in the world. Um, I will admit this statistic is from the Lancet Commission in 2010, so it's slightly dated, um, but it is still kind of a figure that we use to guide um, kind of our activities, whether it's providing direct care, or providing medical training, which is the other kind of leg that Mercy Ships stands on. We really want to leave countries uh, where we serve in a better position to serve um, their own population after we leave. Um, which brings me to our mission statement now, um, which is that Mercy Ships follows the 2000 year old model of Jesus, bringing hope and healing to the forgotten poor. Um, and whenever we're hosting a guest or giving them a tour of the ship, um, they are no exception to this. We really um, want to want people to leave the ship with a sense of both hope and healing, whether it's physical, whether it's spiritual. Um, so Mercy Ships is a Christian organization. We follow the model of Jesus and many of our partners and guests and patients and even some of our volunteers don't share our faith in Jesus. Um, but if you are a volunteer for 10 months or longer, then that is, that's not the case. You really have to be a practicing Christian. Um, but we don't hide it from our partners who leave inspired by what they've seen and heard and by the healing that they get to see and hear talked about when they visit on board. Um, we also make the gospel available, but it's not obligatory to our patients during their time with us. Um, so it's very common to hear that they are not only receptive, but they're curious, which turns into a hunger to know God and the Bible better. And um, we have a whole team that's kind of dedicated to um, just making it available and making sure that it's accessible to our patients. Um, I wouldn't say this is the case for every patient, but it, that is something to celebrate. Um, and I could do an hour long presentation just about the ways um, the gospel does get exposed to those who come in contact with Mercy Ships. But the short summary is that we never ask our patients to put their faith in Jesus during their time with us. That would be maybe a secondary outcome of our care, but of course it's not a condition for anybody to receive care from us or to work with us. Um, as a, in a partnership sort of sense. So we never ever want that to be perceived as one. So that's just something to um, clarify about our faith foundations. Um, and when people hear about the work of Mercy Ships, they usually hear about surgery. Um, they might see the before and after pictures of patients or hear stories about healthcare training. Uh, but what does it mean to bring hope? This is um, a quote on the screen you see from our chief medical officer. I should clarify, he's not the one in the picture. <laughs> I realize that might be a, a kind of mistaken identity. Um, that's Dr. Leo Cheng. He is also an amazing maxillofacial surgeon. Um, but the, the quote is from our chief medical officer, Dr. Gary Parker, who also happens to be a maxillofacial surgeon. He has served with Mercy Ships for over 30 years. And um, 
it's become almost a secondary vision statement for Mercy Shifts. For hope to be credible in the future, it has to be tangible in the present. Um, but what does that mean? So Dr. Gary would say for a patient who has been excluded from the table, it starts with positive interactions with people who treat them like a person again, despite their illness or despite their abnormality. Um, and there is another long-term staff member who visits the ships often, also not Leo Cheng in the photo, he's also amazing, but this person is named um, uh, Stefan Schmidt, he's from Germany, so really Stefan Schmidt. There is another, um, so he comes to visit the ship often, he works at the office in Texas, but he always gives the most encouraging talks to the, um, to the crew when he comes, like he always gets on the schedule for the community meetings, and he says that when people feel no hope, our enemy, the enemy of our faith, he loves that. He loves when people feel like their life will never change, that it will never get better, or that they will always be excluded from the table. Um, so for Mercy Ships to come in and meet those people who don't have other options medically, and to give them an option that is accessible and safe um, to be included again, in, as Dr. Gary would say, in the human race. Um, the enemy hates that. And um, Stefan would say, our enemy, enemy hates the big white ship and everything that we stand for. Um, so there is, um, I, talk, I mentioned a little bit about surgery. I just wanna share a video um, to kind of give, give an introduction to the broader work of Mercy Ships as we're talking about like, the organization kind of measures everything it does by, okay, is this going to leave a lasting impact um, on the countries where we're serving versus just a temporary kind of amelioration of circumstances? It has so many challenges because we have so many patients who have surgical problems and such surgical problems are not really solved properly because first, um, access to care is a problem. And then we have um, a human resource problem. Like for example, I'm the only orthopedic surgeon in this hospital. The workload is quite heavy for me. In addition to the life saved, the hope restored, is that Mercy Ships is providing people with the training and tools to multiply the effects. Everything that we've done is being expanded. Medical capacity ability, if you want to use the old story of teaching a man to fish versus giving the man the fish, that, that's what it is. It's empowering the people within the nation to be able to provide what their people need. What I appreciate about Mercy Ships is that they come in and when they come in, they really invest in the health system of that country. They get to understand what the needs are. They get to know who needs to be trained and what sort of training needs to be provided. They create relationships and networks. Merci Chip m'a permis d'améliorer justement mes aptitudes chirurgicales à prendre en charge ces patients-là. Les cours qu'on a fait lorsque Merci Chip était là m'ont permis également de pouvoir avoir une autre vision sur la qualité de soins que je voudrais qu'on puisse offrir à nos populations. Mercy Ships is investing in farming because Mercy Ships recognize that in terms of have a good health, you need a good nutrition. And for a good nutrition to be effective, then you need to get the best knowledge of how to produce safe food. And that's why we are here. That's what Mercy Ships is doing. that we're going to see a stronger, healthier, more prosperous 
integrated Africa. And a large part of that has to do with the fact that Mercy Ships and so many people who cared were there to partner with the people of Africa. So how um, do we deliver our programs, both the surgeries and our courses? Well, our main platform are, as you could probably guess, the ships. Um, so the next trivia question is, how many ships are in the fleet? Does anyone have a guess? This one is kind of a tricky one. You could say that there are more than one right answer. Is there two technically? That is one of the right answers, yes. So I'll give um, kind of an illustration. Um, there have been in total throughout the history of Mercy Ships, five ships. Um, and the first three, which are along the top here, um, were the last one was retired in 2007. So you had um, ships that actually worked in different parts of the world, the Caribbean Mercy, Island Mercy, which um, did a lot of work in the Pacific Islands, and the Anastasis, which really has been um, to a lot of different places in the world. That one was operating for almost 30 years. Um, that one was finally replaced by the Africa Mercy, which has been the sole Mercy ship since 2007. But um, since, oh gosh, I, I don't remember the year that they started construction. I want to say like 2015. They have been constructing um, the newest member of kind of the Mercy Ships fleet, which they have creatively named the Global Mercy. Um, not making fun, I'm just saying that's, that's the name. And it is um, a slightly larger capacity uh, than the Africa Mercy, which is the bottom left ship. Um, that's where I work. Um, but that one is almost finished construction. The really cool thing about this ship as well is um, the Global Mercy is the first member of the fleet to be a custom built hospital ship, whereas the other ships um, served other purposes um, before becoming a part of the fleet and they were converted. So for example, the Africa Mercy used to be a rail ferry. It would transport trains in Denmark and you can kind of see traces of that on board. Um, but the Global Mercy is the first ship to be custom built, which is really exciting just because you have a lot of features that are going to be better for the medical crew, better for the patients and not kind of like maybe construction compromises <laughs> in some ways. I mean, the ship is really, it's amazing, um, but it's not what it would be probably if we could choose every feature that we wanted to have in a hospital ship, which is what they've kind of done with the Global Mercy. And so that's very just exciting. <clears throat> so where has um, Mercy ships operated in Africa specifically? Um, the countries that are in dark blue are the places that one of the Mercy ships has visited. The Africa Mercy has been to many of them. Um, but it's not, uh, some of them were like visited by the Anastasis as well. Um, and the yellow dot up in the corner, uh, in the northwest corner of Africa is where the ship is right now in the Canary Islands, just to give an illustration. So it's not far, but it's also not in Africa right now, just due to the pandemic, it's in a shipyard in the Canary Islands. Um, and I'll go back to in the in the blue box just zooming in on that area um, the last three years um, to give more specific dates normally the Africa Mercy will operate on kind of a 10 month to two month ratio so you'll see from August to June normally in a normal year um, it's in a field service in a country so August 2017 the ship arrived in Cameroon in June 2018, it went into its annual shipyard maintenance period. Then in August 2018, it went into Guinea, and in June 2019, it went back to its annual shipyard period. And in August 2019, that's when we arrived in Senegal, which is, um, you can see, well, you'll see a closer up map of Senegal, um, but we withdrew from Senegal in March 2020 just due to the pandemic. Normally, we would have stayed until June 2020. Um, and what do we do when we engage with a country? So there is a five-year cycle when we talk about the ship visiting any one of these countries. Um, so to go, um, I'll kind of flip between these two slides. Um, usually what people hear about when they're talking about the work of Mercy Ships is the bottom right corner, you see year three, ship in port. But that, like it says, 
is the third year of Mercy Ships engagement with a uh, country where it is going to serve. Um, it starts all the way back at year one. So just to give um, an example, um, when we were in a field service in Cameroon, we were already engaging in our year one work with Senegal. So in 2017 and 18, we were already preparing for um, potential arrival next year, in the next year in 2019. Um, and so the year one, that kind of involves engaging with the host nation, and that is initiated by the host nation. I think that's important to know that Mercy Ships doesn't come to any country without an invitation from the highest levels of its government. Um, so we engage with the nation first through its political structures. They design a protocol together with, um, between Mercy Ships and the government and kind of take responsibility for different parts of our visit. Um, and they also take into account development targets that are kind of um, developed in, with like the, the WHO standards. Um, so in that year, they'll be working with the Ministry of Health, they'll work with local port authorities and in-country support um, and develop links with other NGOs for kind of a collaborative approach um, and kind of be looking at, okay, is this, is this field service going to be feasible? What would be the parameters? What would be our agreement that we'll enter into in order to do the field service? And then they'll sign what's called a country protocol. And that's just a very formal agreement between Mercy Ships and any host nation um, about what we're going to do, what we will provide, and what we expect the government to provide in order for us to accomplish these shared goals. Um, then it comes to year two. So just to give an example, while the ship was in Guinea, then we were in year two of our um, kind of liaison with Senegal for when we were in Cameroon, we were doing this with Guinea. Um, they basically send teams into the country. Now we have agreed that the ship will officially visit the following year usually. Um, and they're gonna send teams into the country and look at logistically, how are we going to accomplish this? What um, pieces of infrastructure are going to be important to us to accomplish our goals um, with this country? And so along with local healthcare professionals in the host nation, um, kind of in partnership with them, they're gonna do an in-depth analysis of um, potential surgical cases that we would take on. Um, and just an in-depth analysis of the, the current healthcare capacity um, and areas where the Ministry of Health might like to see that developed in this partnership. Then, of course, it comes to year three. Um, that's when the ship arrives in the host nation for 10 months. On average, 12,000 surgical and dental procedures will be delivered, um, most of those being dental um, procedures. That is a very, um, that's like a very, High, usually we treat like, you know, more dental patients than the other patients combined. Um, and then they'll also try to aim for training um, around 1500 medical professionals in the country. So that means with the Ministry of Health, they're going to designate healthcare professionals who would benefit from the training that Mercy Ships offers. Um, whereas normally, the way for them to access similar training might be for them to travel to Europe. Um, which is obviously a difficulty. It's, it, it, it poses an obstacle for um, receiving that training. Um, so to be able to get it um, at the same standards in um, where they're living, that's a huge gift to these medical professionals to kind of develop their skills, further their careers. Um, and then in that, um, I would say in year two, they'll kind of start with renovations or um, on certain healthcare facilities. And then the agreement usually is that Mercy Ships will be able to share those facilities and use them while they're in the country. And then we leave those renovated facilities for however local hospitals or the Ministry of Health want to use them afterwards. Um, then it comes to year four. So for example, while we were in Senegal in 2019 and 20, teams were going into Guinea and also Cameroon for follow-up work. So that means um, they're making evaluation reports. They're kind of looking at how we can um, support future investments in their healthcare. Um, and teams will again go and be on the ground assessing how the training went, how it's being implemented. Is it, was it effective? Is it improving things in the hospitals where we implemented it? And then they'll do any retraining that's really necessary to make sure that um, 
people are following kind of the training standards that they have been given. Um, and then finally in year five, they'll do just a full evaluation report. That's kind of the conclusion of any normal protocol with a country. And so they'll do a report uh, about what was uh, accomplished in the course of these five years um, in partnership with, in, in the partnership between the country and Mercy Ships. Um, and let's see, I'm just checking my notes. So that final report is available, like they, they basically share it with the Ministry of Health and with the wider international development community um, to kind of just have that level of accountability for the impact of the work that we're doing. Um, and I can say from my perspective inside the organization, I know that they are constantly looking for ways um, to improve their impact assessment. You know, just how do we measure the impact that we're making to make sure that we're having the best impact possible for the long term. <laughs> I have been to multiple hour long presentations about the different ways that they're doing this. And so I would love to talk to you more about it if um, you are curious or have time. Um, and just feel free to ask me about it um, at the end of the session or at another, at another time. It's really, um, it's really awesome to hear about. So in Senegal specifically, um, when we arrive in a country and start selecting um, patients who will be a part of our surgical programs, they, um, as you can see with the blue dots, those were the screening sites where they um, went into kind of gather patients. So from that community's perspective, they would start seeing flyers in their local hospitals and in other public facilities about um, if you or someone you know has a condition like this, and then they'll have pictures and descriptions, um, there, will, there, can, there might be help for them with Mercy Ships and kind of try to spread information about the kinds of um, conditions that we treat and um, just the types of surgery that we offer. And uh, hopefully, and then they say, okay, we're gonna have a screening on this day in this kind of community center area. Usually it's an outdoor place because we need a big facility to do a screening event. Um, and then people basically, if they think they might be a candidate for surgery or if they think they know someone, um, we hear a lot of stories of people saying, I heard about Mercy Ships on the radio and I, or you know, my neighbor heard about Mercy Ships and they told me to go to the screening, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of the process for um, informing kind of a population, getting patients to turn out for screenings if they might be a candidate for surgery. And they do these screening events. And then if they get on the schedule for a follow-up screening, if it really looks likely that we'll be able to treat them, um, Mercy Ships will take care of round trip transportation for them to come to the port city, which is at the tip of that dark green section, that's Dakar, um, which fun fact is the furthest west point, west point in Western Africa, continental Africa. Um, so that's kind of where the ship has been. Uh, and patients will get transportation there to come and have their surgery and then get transportation back because we definitely don't want those costs to be a barrier for anyone to um, receive care. Um, so does anyone know, I'm talking about screening for certain surgical specialties, does anyone know what types of surgery we are talking about here? You can just shout them out. Uh, cleft palate. Yep, that's one of them. A palate and cleft lip. Thinking back to if you've seen, um, yeah. The, I don't know, it's called the bowed legs, whatever. Yep, yep. I know the name of it. <laughs> yeah, orthopedic surgery. Anyone else have a, a guess? Well, we can, um, one last one. I think they do eye surgery. Too. I heard eye surgery. Yep, that's tr that's true. Was uh, there also, so also like uh, cyst or uh, large, um, I don't know, growth removal. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
And dental you talked about is the biggest. Yeah, there are, there, there's a dental clinic and then sometimes some of our surgeries are related to dental conditions if they really get quite um, advanced. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so here is the kind of, let's see. We have the list of the kind of programs minus dental, um, which also did take place in Senegal. Um, but as far as our surgical programs, um, this is the list of the types of care. And I wanted to go through and just show you some photos of patients that we treated in Senegal that our comms team was able to follow. Um, so maxillofacial patients, somebody called out um, cleft palate surgeries. So maxillofacial is anything to do with the head and the neck. So you can see um, with Rayanatu, um, she had kind of a jaw tumor, which is, um, yeah, that's a, that's a big portion of the maxillofacial patients that we see, in addition to cleft lip and cleft palate surgeries, um, which you'll see adults and children that come in with those conditions. Um, so it's a great thing for someone like Ray Natu to be able to kind of go and have um, a more normal looking jaw. Um, there's definitely bigger and smaller tumors that we, that we treat, and some of you may have seen photos of um, some of the larger tum tumors, but um, yeah, facial tumors are definitely a big portion of the, the surgeries that we do. And that's one of the programs that we'll offer pretty much throughout a field service. Um, whereas some of them have specific blocks where they will do that type of surgery. Um, that's what you see uh, in the women's health line. Um, that's referring to obstetric fistula surgeries generally, which is a childbirth injury. Um, that was a surgical block that we were not able to get to in our schedule due to the COVID pandemic. Um, so we had to withdraw from the country before that could begin. Hey, how um, many of those that would be like cancerous? Would you treat them if they're cancerous? We would not, no. That's a, good, that's a really good question. It's a really common question. Um, but we actually are not able to treat patients with cancer. Um, and if we were to remove tumors and not be able to treat the, that underlying condition, um, the, the fear is that it would exacerbate the, the cancer. And so we don't, we don't touch those tumors, but really good question, Cheryl. Um, general surgeries, that is um, someone called out um, kind of tumors on any part of the body that would fall under the general category as well as um, hernias and goiters um, and other, yeah, just types of kind of common um, conditions that don't generally go untreated in first world countries. Um, but Babakar was a patient who had a kind of growth on his stomach and his mom, kind of the, the story that the comms team um, heard from his mom was that she was constantly afraid that somebody would see his stomach and think that she had done something wrong, that he had um, some kind of, you know, deeper than skin deep problem with him because he had uh, abnormal growth on his stomach. Um, and so she told him, never, ever show your stomach to anyone. She would dress him in really loose clothes. Um, there's not really a before and after picture of him um, that where you can see it, but um, just wanted to show his picture that that was an example of one of our um, general cases this year. Um, somebody called out bowed, bowed leg and um, knock knees surgery. So that would be an example of orthopedic surgery. We were able to treat 114 orthopedic patients, including these two twins, Usainu and Asan. Um, they were very, very fun to be around <laughs> um, and just really full of energy. So often what you see um, is that orthopedic deformities like this one are sometimes caused by um, some kind of nutritional defici deficiency. So um, it's, it's not always the case, but usually if this started to occur, um, ideally someone would be able to, like a child would be able to have braces on their legs um, before it became a visible issue, um, but in the absence of access to that, um, it can become, um, it can come to a point like you see with these two, um, and it can still be surgically corrected up to the age of, I think, about 14, and then we're really not able with, like, our capacity. It would be possible on an adult, probably, but with such intensive recovery and physical therapy that they would need, that's just not something we're able to provide. So our orthopedic surgeries are available just to kids under the age of 14. Um, but 
but yeah, usually we see really good outcomes at school. It's always exciting. They celebrate like the first time that they walk on their straight legs, as you see in that top picture on the left. Um, that's them taking a few steps and usually it is not without some tears because it is scary and your center of balance has changed from um, when your legs were in a different shape. Um, but they were just, um, yeah, it, I love looking at their photos, like the one of them stretching on the little platform across from the ship always makes me kind of laugh because that is that was their personality. <laughs> so. Hey, I have a question. So you said a lot of times this is caused by like a nutritional. So I'm assuming there's some education with the parents then on how to have that. Yeah, better? yeah. And it kind of, I mean, it goes into, um, I mean, what you'll sometimes see um, is like there was there was a case in Cameroon where they had some patients turn out for screening and they became communications patients. Um, and then when they went back to their community, you know, the comms team sometimes will go with these patients and follow them and um, go with them when they go home with a, a handful of these patients. And when they went back to their village, basically, they realized that there were other children in their community who hadn't come to the screening, but who were having the same problem. And so it can become kind of a community issue. Um, and that's really, and it has to do with resources. Um, and it's not really something that Mercy Ships can necessarily solve once it's become um, an issue for an individual. Like, you know, they, Usainu and Asan wouldn't have been able to correct it without surgery at this point, but hopefully going back to their community, they'll be able to um, kind of, uh, that they can be an example and maybe uh, their experience can educate others on, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with you if you have this disease, but it does kind of point to like some things that you could be doing differently. Um, I can say Mercy Ships has a nutritional agriculture course that kind of focuses on, um, Oh, what's it called? I mean, it's, it's nutritional agriculture. So it's talking about what are the um, farming methods that can really lead to a healthier population to um, kind of avoid problems like this in the future. So, and that's not to say that like this wouldn't occur in um, a context like, I mean, in the US people still experience things like rickets, which is uh, what one of the terms for like a disease where a child will have bowed legs, um, but the difference is maybe access to braces, leg braces. So I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> but um, talking about, I'm going to go on to the next slide. Um, Aliu is one of our reconstructive plastics patients, and um, I have a video that will share a bit about his story. Um, but you can see when we have a patient who has suffered from something like a burn um, that causes a skin contracture. Um, that's not, you know, at the time, obviously, it's very, very painful. And then it kind of scars into um, a, a shape where their, their limb is no longer fully functional. Um, so you'll see kind of a video of Ellie's story. <laughs> Dem Dafai de Dalal ma ubil ma lip, 
sama am jam sama dom am jam po rerek padal moko bongir Kontana story um so yeah a lot of the plastics patients that we see whether they're children or adults um we hear a lot of stories of accidents like that that have happened just around the house on a normal day um whether it's with an outdoor cooking setup which is very very common in many places in west africa or whether it's using a lantern that caught fire to something else um that's a pretty common story for our reconstructed plastics patients um, and without access to immediate care for their injuries, that um, can cause the outcome that you see with LU. But if they are then able to use skin grafts, um, basically the goal of our plastic surgeries, where whereas like in the first world, you think of it as like um, kind of a, an aesthetic thing, but actually they, they wouldn't focus so much on like you can see kind of the cosmetic um, damage on the side of his head, they wouldn't focus on that. They would really focus on restoring the function for Aliu, like you saw in the, um, in the movie. So they'll focus on the goals of, okay, what kind of functions, what kind of activities do we, we want to make sure that you feel able to do after the surgery. And hopefully it's everything that they can think to do. You know, they want to get it working as much like a normal limb as possible. So um, then we move on to, I'm going to skip over women's health just because we didn't have any um, patients in that program during the Senegal field service. Um, you'll see for our ophthalmic program, um, somebody called out eye surgeries or cataract surgeries. That's what this would be. Um, we're able to do kind of a larger number during the field service just because it's a very quick surgery. It takes maybe 20 to 30 minutes to remove cataracts from someone's eyes and they're able to do a large number of those procedures in a day. Um, so uh, normally I've been showing videos and photos of Senegal patients, but Babadi was actually a uh, patient from Guinea in 2012. And I put him in here just because I love his before and after photos. His portraits are in the hospital in the ship on deck three. Um, and even though you don't see like, you know, you can see the cataracts in his eyes, but other than that, there's really no before and after. But then when you see his after photo, I love seeing um, just how you can see the difference, even though there's no change physically on his face, but um, in the way he smiles and, when you uh when i hear people like giving tours and talking about his story you know we'll walk past his photo and the story that will tell um that everyone kind of hears about babadi was that when they took the kind of patches off of his eyes after a surgery and he could see for the first time he gave the best possible answer and he turned to his wife and said you're even more beautiful than i can remember um so that was just a sweet story that we love talking about around mercy ships um but those are our ophthalmic surgeries. Um, next one would be our club foot clinic. So this is a big um, medical capacity building program. They have a large group of local doctors that come in and work with our relatively small club foot team um, to work with um, small children, usually under the age of three. Um, and what they'll do is they'll, it's a pretty, pretty non-invasive procedure that involves a small surgery and then wearing braces for um, a certain amount of time, and they're able to correct this condition. Um, and hopefully they say kids will never ever remember that they had this problem, um, but that is, that is our club foot program. Um, the last one, which is not really a surgical program, but I wanna mention it here, is our palliative care program. Um, so we have a team that kind of takes care of if a patient wants to, if they're not eligible for our surgical programs, um, they might be able to opt into our palliative care program, which just has to do with kind of giving them information, giving them um, strategies to manage, whether it be pain, whether it be terminal illness, 
Um, that would be kind of the work that our palliative care team does. So their whole day, basically, when they're working with patients is going to their house and visiting them, but also their family and talking to them about um, what to expect ahead and how they can prepare for that and how they can live with the most dignity possible um, given their circumstances. So moving on to um, talking about, so surgeries are kind of one leg you could say that Mercy Ship stands on. The second one would be medical capacity building. So you saw a little clip of Dr. Audrey Agbesi in the video at the beginning of the presentation. I always kind of have a fangirl moment when I see her on the ship because we've done like stories about her. She is Benin's first reconstructive plastic surgeon. She was like, that wasn't Mercy Ships doing, that was her. She studied, she trained, and that's what she became. And then she was able to participate in mentoring when the ship was in Benin. Um, so she is kind of like, she has become a Mercy Ship spokesperson in addition to still being a reconstructive plastic surgeon. Um, but she would be an example of, um, in Senegal, we had 87 mentoring participants. So obviously in Senegal, they, we would have Senegalese surgeons and doctors coming to our programs. Um, but that means that sometimes they're able to come into the operating rooms with our surgeons and perform the surgery side by side. Nurse mentoring means sometimes um, local nurses are coming into our wards and working with our patients alongside their mentors or the other half of the time, their mentor will go into their hospital setting and really work with them where they are and with the resources that they have um, to kind of help and work alongside them. Um, and then the second type of, um, oops, the second type of training that we do are our courses. And these are really training the trainer courses. And this is what Dr. Audrey, I think, is teaching in this um, class. So Ministry of Health, Health will help select participants and um, kind of enroll them. They'll help to provide a venue and will provide a lot of courses that have to do with training the trainers. And um, what that means is basically when participants go from that course and receive their certificate, they're now qualified to deliver the same training um, to others in their kind of healthcare circles. Um, and just an example of one of these trainings that are done. Next trivia question is what tool has been shown to reduce post-operative mortality by 50% and costs as much as a sheet of paper? Does anyone have an idea? Give it a couple more seconds if you think you have an answer. Otherwise, I'm gonna go to the next slide. It is the WHO Surgical Safety Checklist. This is a tool that is um, used and it's mandatory in any American hospital and I think a lot of hospitals in the European Union as well. Um, and it's becoming more ubiquitous in West African hospitals. Um, basically, that means that they'll go through this checklist before, during, and after the surgery. That's what those three columns on the sheet are for. And it has to do with, um, for example, um, one of the items on the checklist is everyone in the OR is going to go around and introduce yourself and say your role. Why are you in this operating room? So that everyone knows why everyone else is there and who they are. Um, does everyone know what part of the body we're operating on? What are the patient's allergies? Um, what type of blood do they, do they need? Um, and then they'll go through and count all of their instruments before and after the surgery and make sure that nothing is left inside. And like I said, this tool um, has been shown to reduce surgical mortality by 50%. And um, there's a team from the ship that will go around to different hospitals and they'll come back and alight on the ship and maybe rest for a weekend and then go out and visit more hospitals, training trainers to train others in the use of this tool. And that's a thing that they do a lot of follow up with. So they'll go around and do their trainings and then they'll go around to each hospital again and ask them, how's it going? Have you been implementing this? If not, why not? Um, and just looking at how can they um, make this a really integral part of the surgical programs at different hospitals. So that's kind of a introduction to surgeries and MCD. There's obviously a lot more to be said. If you have questions, I really welcome them. Um, but just wanted to give a quick overview of what is going on with Mercy Ships now. Um, the, next, the next trivia question actually, some of you may know this. How many people normally live on board? 
This is kind of tricky. I'm talking about the Africa Mercy here. Anybody have an idea? Is it B? C? It's, it is C. It's closer to B right now with their current shipyard period, but normally it is C. 400 to 450 people will live on board. Um, so here's a photo of us. Um, I am I'm in the middle, you can see right there. And uh, I love this quote that I think, oh, oh, it was Casey who gave this quote at Alpha last week. She um, said, I can do things you cannot. Actually, it was, it was during our church service, but I just wrote it down and just stuck it in my presentation. It was, I can do things you cannot, you can do things I cannot, and together we can do great things. Um, and that, I wanted to put it in my presentation because that's such a great illustration of the ship. Um, I would say about 40% of the crew are medical, medically oriented in some way, and the rest are doing completely different things. You know, you have your technical crew, you have your HR, your finance, we have teachers that are taking care of educating the children that come on board with their families who are working on board. Um, and you have a lot of administrative staff, you have dining room, you have housekeeping, but um, it takes a village. It takes literally all of us to make this operation work, which is such a cool thing to talk about. And then I couldn't um, talk about our team on board without talking about our 250 local day crew. So this is something um, we hire day crew in every country that we go to. And basically anywhere there are patients, there are also day crew. They work in more departments than just in the hospital with the patients. But that is um, the biggest reason that we have day crew with us is to make sure that um, basically facilitating communication. You know, they're helping. They're an integral part of the care if we can't understand um, what patients are saying in Wolof or in French or in Susu or whatever language they speak, um, we wouldn't be able to care for them properly. And so they do such an amazing job and it's just, it's fun to see like how close the patients get to the day crew because um, they make the hospital a much less threatening place for them to be. If everything else is unfamiliar, at least they have um, somebody working with them who speaks their language and um, who can help them communicate and ask for what they need. Um, so in this big machine of mercy shifts, my role for the last two years has been as the executive assistant. So I mentioned that we have a lot of partnerships with government and other on land partners. And so my department, the executive department, um, really manages a lot of those um, partnerships and makes sure that we maintain them in a really good way. And so you can see in the top corner um, on the right, um, that is the day that we arrived in Senegal and we welcomed the First Lady of Senegal as well as the Minister of Health on board for just kind of a ceremonial visit. Um, I think both of them had already, I know the Minister of Health had already been on board before, um, but we just make sure that we um, are maintaining those partnerships and also working ahead. So you can see in the top left, that's a delegation from Sierra Leone and um, the ship is looking at visiting um, or creating a partnership with Sierra Leone in the next few years. And so that is one of the starts of our partnership with them. Um, and so when we have visitors on board, we'll take them around the hospital, we'll show them how the ship works, we'll give them a little introduction to the community. And um, that's some of what my department does. It's really hard to kind of um, summarize my role in one slide, um, but just to give an idea of what I'm up to with my department, I'm doing a lot of admin and support work to facilitate those visits. Um, so kind of to conclude this part of the presentation talking about the community we believe that changed people change lives and changed lives change nations and this is the case for not only our patients and our crew and our day crew but also for our partners we i think i've seen giving a lot of tours on board that when people are able to visit the ship um they don't leave the same. This is the, the, there's no exception to this really, um, to see what goes on on board. People are just so encouraged and kind of inspired and uplifted. And so, and that's really um, something that makes an impact not only on them as individuals, but then on nations to know, um, yeah, I just love this quote is from our VP of International Programs, Cornet. Um, he gave it the other week. And so I just wanted to throw it in because it was inspiring to me. So, um, just to give a little overview of what happened 
in March. Um, just a really quick overview. Um, they decided to suspend the field service kind of mid-March and told all the crew that they were free to go home regardless of their position. Um, and the last surgery then was completed on March 21st and they discharged remaining patients um, to partner hospitals where we knew they would be cared for. Um, and these were hospitals that we had worked with in the course of our um, MCB, medical, medical capacity building. Um, and then at the end of March, that's when we departed from Dakar with um, a, a greatly reduced crew and it's become more reduced since then. And the ship has been in Tenerife um, in the Canary Islands, like I mentioned. Um, so you have the Canary Islands in this top picture, um, right off the coast of Morocco, and Tenerife is one of the middle islands. It's the largest island. Um, so that's kind of where we've been ever since. Um, but the activity, a lot of our activities has stopped. They've changed a lot, but just to give an overview of what we're up to right now, um, there have been a lot of PPE donations. Um, there's PPE that we haven't needed. And so we are working on from different offices that kind of store those supplies. They immediately, um, I would say within the next month, started looking for, okay, who might need these supplies more than we do in Texas and the Netherlands? Those are where our two supply offices are. Um, and we even offloaded some from the ship that we didn't foresee needing for the immediate future, not treating patients. Um, going counterclockwise, um, the ship is in Spain right now. Like I mentioned, the Canary Islands is part of Spain. They're in a shipyard period, so doing a lot of maintenance projects that they normally would do in the summer, but it's a little bit slowed down. Um, I didn't know this, but in a presentation I was listening to like two weeks ago, I learned that they are still doing a food for life program. So they do an agricultural training. The guy in the middle of that photo, his name is Eliphaz. He's from Benin. And they and he does this training in every country that we go to, but he's kind of doing a condensed version of it in Benin at the moment, which I thought was great. It's um, that nutritional agriculture course that I mentioned. Um, in the bottom right, um, they're preparing to start some advanced work in Senegal and Liberia. Um, they think right now that the ship might go to Senegal at the end of April, which would mean advanced work would really start in earnest in February, but they're already sending teams just to do kind of a advanced assessment um, as early as this month. Um, they're both going to Senegal and Liberia. So like I said, the intent is for the ship to return to Senegal. We're gonna follow up with patients that we actually had to postpone in our surgical schedule due to the pandemic. Um, and then after the field service in Senegal, the plan is to then go to Liberia, which funny story is where the ship would be now if there weren't a pandemic, but we are, we are where we are right now, <laughs> aren't we? Um, and then in the top right corner, uh, we have the pandemic. One of the, like, I would say positive outcomes is that it's um, encouraged us to expand our e-learning um, opportunities. So I think um, this looks like it was a online um, club foot care course. Um, and the nice thing about e-learning is that it um, not only um, not only do you, are you more flexible to scale up or scale down your course, you know, you're not limited by the room size where you're able to hold the course, um, but you also don't have to hold the course for just one, um, like, geographical area. They're able to host people from many different places, and so I think that's a great thing to be able to expand during this time. Um, and they're also doing courses, I think, in, like, mental health and um, critical care and palliative care are a few other courses that are going on right now remotely. Oh, okay, one question. In an earlier video, it was mentioned that Mercy Ships helps out with infrastructure development. I wonder if that includes more modern day safe heating systems and electricity, so standard fires aren't used as much. Um, really good question. I think I, the, um, Infrastructure courses are more for talking about healthcare infrastructure. So they'll be working in like hospitals and operating rooms to kind of update those facilities and not so much in people's individual homes. Um, but really good question. Great. Um, how long is a typical hospital stay? 
that would, like I said, depend on the type of surgery. Um, we have the hospital on board that has its 80 something, 70 something beds available. And there's also a facility that Mercy Ships uses um, in every country on land. They'll kind of designate a spot to be what's called the Hope Center is an area where it acts as a hotel for patients. So when they come into, for example, Dakar for surgery, if they come from way outside of the city and don't have a family member to stay with, we wanna make sure that the cost of um, living and staying close to the ship for follow-up appointments is not prohibitive. So the Hope Center um, provides like it's free of charge. They get beds, they get food, um, they get community with other patients um, and they get to not be confined in a bed in the hospital, which is great. So as soon as we're able to discharge them, if they're not getting like multiple times a day bandage changes or that kind of thing, they'll move out to the Hope Center and then they'll come back maybe twice or once a week for physical therapy or for dressing changes or for other follow-up appointments. Um, so for maybe a general patient or a um, cleft lip patient or some other maxillofacial patients, they'll be there for less than a week in the hospital on board, and then they'll maybe have them go to the Hope Center. But when it comes to like, I think orthopedic surgeries or some more intensive um, maxillofacial surgeries or with our women's health surgeries when we have those surgeries, but I wanna say it's at least like three or four weeks that a patient can stay in the hospital on board. So um, another question is no emergency procedures, correct? That is right. We are not gonna get someone come in with like a motorcycle accident or cardiac arrest or something like that. We don't have cardiac surgery um, on board and yeah, somebody would need to go to a, a local facility for an emergency like that just because of the screening process for us. Did yeah. are the majority of the staff on board from the U.S. and what other countries are represented? Great question. Um, I would say about 40, 35 or 40 percent of the crew are American, which is a large percentage. I forget how many that um, there's usually like over 100 Americans. Um, there's a lot of us, um, but they actually during the course of a field service, they'll have people from upwards of like 40 different countries come on board. So some of the other really big nationalities would be like Canadian. There's a lot of Dutch people that serve on board. We see a lot of um, Australians and Kiwis and um, like people from New Zealand. And uh, then other places in Europe, we have a lot of crew coming from West Africa. Um, it's possible for members of the day crew. That's usually um, people, crew members from West Africa, many of them start as day crew working with us in different capacities in the hospital. And then um, if they apply, they can go through a process and become a crew member. So we have crew that come from Sierra Leone, Liberia, Benin. There's a lot of people from Benin and Cameroon um, and a couple of crew that are from Guinea. So we have um, a, few, a few Togolese crew, but there, it's absolutely awesome to have them on board. Um, so it's great to live in a kind of multicultural community. Very, very fun. Kate, what is the screening process and like how many people do you have to turn away? Like I'm guessing there's a lot that get turned away and so how do they determine yeah. who actually gets help and who doesn't? Yeah, um, it, it's always a challenge, I will say that. Um, partially because the types of surgery that we do is limited. You know, they, they kind of, not to say that they want it to be limited, but they know that we have a limited capacity on board. So they want to focus really well on kind of the types of surgeries that I, that I kind of explained um, and not spread too thin. They want to go really deep and really well in those specialties. Um, and a lot of effort goes into explaining and in you know, spreading information about these are the types of surgeries that we do. Um, but at the same time, at a typical screening event, you will get people that say, I have a headache. Can I have some medication? Well, Mercy Ships won't give someone medication just like that. Um, it's not a surgical condition. We can't help them. So there are some cases like that. There are people that come, they have a tumor and it's found to be cancerous. We can't treat that. Um, so I would say usually the expectation is that out of a screening event um, from just different factors like that, um, usually it's about one in 10 that we're able to take. 
Um, and then, like I said, there are options depending on what their options might be as an individual. They might be eligible for palliative care if they're um, willing to receive that. Is there help for or support for the staff who, and it has to be hard to turn people away? Like how is the staff supported in that so that they can continue to stay on this good course, you know, because yes. otherwise you can get so emotionally drained from that. that it is, it's very true. Um, I actually, I have a friend named Christelle who is on the screening team. So that's really the team that is in charge of that kind of aspect of our work. Well, when we're talking about specifically the team that has to say those no's, obviously it's hard to hear no and it's hard to say that. Um, they really have their eyes on, they know, um, first of all, they're really trained in like, what are the conditions that we can treat and what can we not treat? You know, if they come to a surgeon screening, we know that a surgeon would say no to them for this reason. And so they're not going to say yes to them at one stage only to know that they're going to come to Dakar and then be told no by our surgeon. Um, I think they keep that in their heads a lot that to, they don't want to like build up kind of hope and anticipation if they're not going to find it when they come to the ship. Um, so that helps them a lot to kind of balance, you know, they know that and it's the right thing to not say yes when they know it's a no. Um, they, they really have the rest of the ship pray for them a lot because we know that it's not an easy task. Um, but if you ask someone who's on the screening team, like my friend Christelle, um, they usually, those screening events are hard, but they also love to see post-op patients and be able to discharge them and focus on like, here are the ones that we were able to help. Um, and if in talking to people that are on the screening team, I know that that is a huge uplift for them just to know that the ones that they were saying yes to, that was worthwhile. Um, let's see some other questions. What are your and the organization's greatest needs right now? Prayer. We need prayer. <laughs> you can pray for mercy ships. Um, yeah, there's a lot of difficult decisions going on right now. They in some ways are actually still recruiting right now. So if you know someone um, who might be looking for a volunteer position, I know that they are always looking for um, volunteer captains, volunteer maritime crew. Um, they're looking for admin personnel. I think they're looking for a senior chef at the moment, if that hasn't changed in the last week. Um, and they're still recruiting for when we're able to go back to Africa and for the current period, you know, they have people that are working on board. Um, Kate, uh, what about contributions? How do we make a contribution to you and to Mercy Ships? Good question. There's a few different ways. Um, I will post the link to my blog in here and there's a fundraising page um, for me personally. But you can also go to the, let's see, I'm going to not type and talk at the same time because then I'll end up typing what I say. What I say. Um, but that's the link to my blog. And then you can also okay. go to mercyships.org um, and they have a link to give. And so I think you should be able to give a general donation to the organization or look me up specifically. Um, okay. There's, uh, if you go to my blog, there's a fundraising page um, that has kind of updates as of this month as well as.